This is the Kremlin, citadel of Russian communism. Looking at Russia, we might see it as a country to be studied, as we study other nations of the world. Yet we know that Russia today is regarded as a grave threat to our nation, to our freedom, to the peace of the world. Why so? What makes it a threat? Looking closer, we see a clue. Public display of giant portraits of communist leaders. These leaders, by their actions, have caused the world to stand guard. Here, in Russia, you see the reason why so many nations are building up their defenses. Here, in Russia, you see the reason why we are spending billions of dollars in defense production why your family is paying the highest taxes in our history. The leaders of Russia tell us their only concern is the defense of their own nation. Is this so? Or are they ambitious for world conquest? Question. A question communism. Ever hear of Karl Marx? In his mind, communism was born more than a hundred years ago. He looked at the world and saw men as divided into two classes, workers and capitalists. In the Communist Manifesto, he called upon the workers, the proletarians, to rise up and overthrow their capitalistic masters. He cried, the proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries, unite. This was the promise and the challenge of communism. In Russia, the Tsar was the government. To support the wealthy aristocracy, millions of peasants toiled in virtual slavery. The Cossacks, dreaded police of the Tsar, enforced tyrannical laws. Here was fertile ground for the ideas of communism. For here, indeed, the people had nothing to lose but their chains, the chains of the imperial government. In 1914, the Tsar sent his troops into the war that swept Europe. For more than two years, they fought. While at home, people suffered from shortages, brought about the despotism and corruption of the imperial government. The people grew rebellious. Only a strong army could sustain the Tsar in power. But revolution was preached on the battlefield, too, to an army broken with corruption. Inevitably, the Russian army surrendered. And with the defeated army returning under the banners of revolution, the imperial government fell and revolution reigned. The chains were broken and in violence was born the government of the proletarians. But a government needs leaders. Ever hear of Nikolai Lenin? He was the first leader of communist Russia. Leon Trotsky was another. Lenin lived but a few years, and out of the vicious struggle for power that followed his death, Joseph Stalin emerged as undisputed leader. Here was a new face, but in the background was an old one, Karl Marx. He established the ultimate aim of communism as world revolution. And the rulers of communist Russia while firmly establishing their authority at home, created an international organization to stir up revolution throughout the world. Communism was on the march. Stalin was in the Kremlin. But what of the people? The proletarians who had fought to win a new world. Their new world might look promising, but although the land had been taken away from the capitalists, the workers didn't get it. Under communism, virtually everything belongs to the state. The individual has little right to own property or to plan his own life. He's told where to work with his employer. Little freedom to leave his job or seek a better one. Whereas we believe, and our religions teach, that the individual is all important, communism denies religion and debases the individual to a part of the vast machine that powers the state. Children are taken early and molded to fit the machine. Here is no search for truth. 
The government writes the textbooks, and the children are taught to accept communism and their fate without question. The Kremlin runs all elections, and the outcome is always the same. If anyone dares to disagree, he's given a speedy trial without benefit of jury. Such traitors may be immediately executed or sent off to prison. The proletarians have nothing to but their chains. They have a world to win. Although the people of Russia gained little, the rulers gained mightily in power. They built up a giant war machine, looking forward to the day when their flag would fly over the entire world. Then came the rise of Nazi Germany, another power bent on world conquest. The two nations joined forces, and Russia, believing itself safe from aggression, launched an invasion of Finland and other neighboring nations. For the first time, the world learned that the communists were no longer waiting for world revolution, but were now resorting to outright military aggression to extend their power. After the Nazis turned on their former allies, we supplied Russia with immense quantities of military equipment to wage war against our common foe. And how did Russia come out of the war? In 1917, at the time of the revolution, Russia was already a land of vast area. Soon after the end of World War II, Russia had occupied many new territories, bringing additional millions of people under communist control, and serving notice that Soviet Russia was now a world power to be reckoned with. United with Russia in war, we strove to preserve that unity and peace. We helped organize the United Nations, in which the nations of the world have mutually pledged to cooperate in fostering world peace and progress. Andrei Gromyko signed for Russia. But in the first post-war Italian elections, the communists created disorder in an attempt to gain control of the government. Once more, the world was reminded that basic in the idea of communism is the plan of world revolution and that Russian communism has stepped beyond that plan to achieve world domination through aggression. In Indochina and Malaya, communist aggression has incited rebellion against established government. In France, communist aggression has fomented strikes against essential industries in attempts to discredit the free government. In Iran, the communists have incited rioting and have preached hatred and distrust of the Western nations. In Eastern Germany, they have openly opposed the West. In China, the communists have established their own puppet government. In Korea, communist aggression has come into actual combat with forces of the United Nations. And with the most deadly of all weapons available to the Russians, no peoples in the world can feel secure against this aggression. How are we meeting this challenge? Yes, one way is by helping the free world fight starvation and poverty and suffering. Conditions that pave the way for communist infiltration. We are also supplying equipment for the free nations to develop their own resources and raise their living standards. Another way we are meeting the challenge is by military alliance with some of the other free nations for mutual aid in opposing direct communist aggression. And we are building up our own military defense. But do these preparations mean that we have abandoned hope for peace? No. In the United Nations, we are continually seeking a workable plan for living in peace with communist Russia. Because we want peace. But we do not want this. We believe in freedom. Freedom. Born of the conviction that every person is a child of God and is therefore of supreme worth. For these people, for ourselves, 
for everyone we want freedom not tyranny